Section 4 of The Autobiography of Charles Darwin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich, Alexandria, Virginia, June 2009. The Autobiography of Charles Darwin, edited by his son Francis Darwin. Section 4. From my return to England, October 2nd, 1836, to my marriage, January 29, 1839. From my marriage, January 29, 1839, and residence in Upper Gower Street, to our leaving London and settling at Down, September 14, 1842. These two years and three months were the most active ones which I ever spent, though I was occasionally unwell, and so lost some time. After going backwards and forwards several times between Shrewsbury, Mare, Cambridge, and London, I settled in lodgings at Cambridge, in Fitzwilliam Street, on December 13th, where all my collections were under the care of Henslow. I stayed there three months and got my minerals and rocks examined by the aid of Professor Miller. I began preparing my journal of travels, which was not hard work, as my manuscript journal had been written with care, and my chief labor was making an abstract of my more interesting scientific results. I sent also, at the request of Lyell, a short account of my observations on the elevation of the coast of Chile to the Geological Society. In Geological Society Proceedings 2, 1838, pages 446 through 449. On March 7, 1837, I took lodgings in Great Marlborough Street in London and remained there for nearly two years until I was married. During these two years, I finished my journal, read several publications before the Geological Society, began preparing the manuscript for my geological observations, and arranged for the publication of the Zoology of the Voyage of the Beagle. In July, I opened my first notebook for facts in relation to the origin of species, about which I had long reflected, and never ceased working for the next twenty years. During these two years, I also went a little into society and acted as one of the honorary secretaries of the Geological Society. I saw a great deal of Lyell. One of his chief characteristics was his sympathy with the work of others, and I was as much astonished as delighted at the interest which he showed when, on my return to England, I explained to him my views on coral reefs. This encouraged me greatly, and his advice and example had much influence on me. During this time I saw also a good deal of Robert Brown. I used often to call and sit with him during his breakfast on Sunday mornings, and he poured forth a rich treasure of curious observations and acute remarks, but they almost always related to minute points, and he never with me discussed large or general questions in science. During these two years, I took several short excursions as a relaxation, and one longer one to the parallel roads of Glenroy, an account of which was published in the Philosophical Transactions, 1839, pages 39 through 82. This paper was a great failure, and I am ashamed of it, having been deeply impressed with what I had seen of the elevation of the land of South America. I attributed the parallel lines to the action of the sea, but I had to give up this view when Agassiz propounded his glacier-like theory, because no other explanation was possible under our then state of knowledge. I argued in favor of sea action, and my error has been a good lesson to me never to trust in science to the principle of exclusion. As I was not able to work all day at science, I read a good deal during these two years on various subjects, including some metaphysical books, 
but I was not well fitted for such studies. About this time I took much delight in Wordsworth's and Coleridge's poetry, and can boast that I read the excursion twice through. Formerly Milton's Paradise Lost had been my chief favorite, and in my excursions during the voyage of the Beagle, when I could take only a single volume, I always chose Milton. From my marriage, 1839, and residence in Upper Gower Street, to our leaving London, 1842. Editor's Note After speaking of his happy married life and of his children, he continues, Francis Darwin. During the three years and eight months while we rested in London, I did less scientific work, though I worked as hard as I possibly could than during any other equal length of time in my life. This was owing to frequently recurring unwellness, and to one long and serious illness. The greater part of my time, when I could do anything, was devoted to my work on coral reefs, which I had begun before my marriage, and of which the last proof sheet was corrected on May 6, 1842. This book, though a small one, cost me twenty months of hard work, as I had to read every work on the islands of the Pacific and to consult many charts. It was thought highly of by scientific men, and the theory therein given is, I think, now well established. No other work of mine was begun in so deductive a spirit as this, for the whole theory was thought out on the west coast of South America, before I had seen a true coral reef. I had therefore only to verify and extend my views by a careful examination of living reefs, but it should be observed that I had during the two previous years been incessantly attending to the effects on the shores of South America of the intermittent elevation of the land, together with denudation and the deposition of sediment. This necessarily led me to reflect much on the effects of subsidence, and it was easy to replace in imagination the continued deposition of sediment by the upward growth of corals. To do this was to form my theory of the formation of barrier reefs and atolls. Beside my work on coral reefs, during my residence in London, I read before the Geological Society papers on the erratic boulders of South America. Geological Society, Proceedings 3, 1842. On Earthquakes, in Geology Transactions, Volume 1840. And on the formation by the agency of earthworms of mold. Geological Society, Proceedings 2, 1838. I also continued to superintend the publication of the zoology of the voyage of the Beagle, nor did I ever intermit collecting facts bearing on the origin of species, and I could sometimes do this when I could do nothing else from illness. In the summer of 1842 I was stronger than I had been for some time, and took a little tour by myself in North Wales for the sake of observing the effects of the old glaciers which formerly filled all the larger valleys. I published a short account of what I saw in the Philosophical Magazine, Philosophical Magazine, 1842. This excursion interested me greatly, and it was the last time I was ever strong enough to climb mountains or to take long walks such as are necessary for geological work. During the early part of our life in London, I was strong enough to go into general society, and saw a good deal of several scientific men, and other more or less distinguished men. I will give my impressions with respect to some of them, though I have little to say worth saying. I saw more of Lyell than of any other man, both before and after my marriage. His mind was characterized as it appeared to me, by clearness, caution, sound judgment, and a good deal of originality. When I made any remark to him on geology, he never rested until he saw the whole case clearly, 
and often made me see it more clearly than I had done before. He would advance all possible objections to my suggestion, and even after these were exhausted would long remain dubious. A second characteristic was his hearty sympathy with the work of other scientific men. The slight repetition here, observable, is accounted for by the notes on Lyell, etc., having been added April 1881, a few years after the rest of the recollections were written. On my return from the voyage of the Beagle, I explained to him my views on coral reefs, which differed from his, and I was greatly surprised and encouraged by the vivid interest which he showed. His delight in science was ardent, and he felt the keenest interest in the future progress of mankind. He was very kind-hearted and thoroughly liberal in his religious beliefs, or rather disbeliefs, but he was a strong theist. His candor was highly remarkable. He exhibited this by becoming a convert to the descent theory, though he had gained much fame by opposing Lamarck's views, and this after he had grown old. He reminded me that I had many years before said to him, when discussing the opposition of the old school of geologists to his new views, what a good thing it would be if every scientific man was to die when sixty years old, as afterwards he would be sure to oppose all new doctrines. But he hoped that now he might be allowed to live. The science of geology is enormously indebted to Lyell, more so, as I believe, than to any other man who ever lived. When I was starting on the voyage of the Beagle, the sagacious Henslow, who, like all other geologists, believed at that time in successive cataclysms, advised me to get and study the first volume of the Principles, which had then just been published, but on no account to accept the views therein advocated. How differently would anyone now speak of the principles? I am proud to remember that the first place, namely St. Iago, in the Cape de Verde archipelago, in which I geologized, convinced me of the infinite superiority of Lyell's views over those advocated in any other work known to me. The powerful effects of Lyell's works could formerly be plainly seen in the different progress of the science in France and England, the present total oblivion of Elie de Beaumont's wild hypotheses, such as his craters of elevation and lines of elevation, which latter hypothesis I heard Sedgwick at the Geological Society lauding to the skies, may be largely attributed to Lyell. I saw a good deal of Robert Brown, Facile Princeps Botanicorum, as he was called by Humboldt. He seemed to me to be chiefly remarkable for the minuteness of his observations and their perfect accuracy. His knowledge was extraordinarily great, and much died with him, owing to his excessive fear of ever making a mistake. He poured out his knowledge to me in the most unreserved manner, yet was strangely jealous on some points. I called him two or three times before the voyage of the Beagle, and on one occasion he asked me to look through a microscope and describe what I saw. This I did, and believe now, that it was the marvelous currents of protoplasm in some vegetable cell. I then asked him what I had seen, but he answered me, That is my little secret. He was capable of the most generous actions. When old, much out of health, and quite unfit for any exertion, he daily visited, as Hooker told me, an old man's servant, who lived at a distance, and whom he supported, and read aloud to him. This is enough to make up for any degree of scientific penuriousness or jealousy. I may here mention a few other eminent men, whom I have occasionally seen but I have little to say about them worth saying. I felt a high reverence for Sir J. Herschel, and was delighted to dine with him at his charming house in the Cape of Good Hope, and afterwards at his London house. 
I saw him also, on a few other occasions. He never talked much, but every word which he uttered was worth listening to. I once met at breakfast at Sir R. Murchison's house in the illustrious Humboldt, who honored me by expressing a wish to see me. I was a little disappointed with the great man, but my anticipations probably were too high. I can remember nothing distinctly about our interview, except that Humboldt was very cheerful and talked much. Reminds me of Buckle, whom I once met at Hensley Wedgwood's. I was very glad to learn from him his system of collecting facts. He told me that he bought all the books which he read, and made a full index to each of the facts which he thought might provide serviceable to him, and that he could always remember in what book he had read anything, for his memory was wonderful. I asked him how, at first, he could judge what facts would be serviceable and he answered that he did not know, but that a sort of instinct guided him. From this habit of making indices, he was enabled to give the astonishing number of references on all sorts of subjects, which may be found in his History of Civilization. This book I thought most interesting, and read it twice, but I doubt whether his generalizations are worth anything. Buckle was a great talker, and I listened to him saying hardly a word, nor indeed could I have done so, for he left no gaps. When Mrs. Ferrer began to sing, I jumped up and said that I must listen to her. After I had moved away, he turned around to a friend and said, as was overheard by my brother, Well, Mr. Darwin's books are much better than his conversation. Of other great literary men, I once met Sidney Smith at Dean Millman's house. There was something inexplicably amusing in every word which he uttered. Perhaps this was partly due to the expectation of being amused. He was talking about Lady Cork, who was then extremely old. This was the lady who, as he said, was once so much affected by one of his charity sermons that she borrowed a guinea from a friend to put in the plate. He now said, It is generally believed that my dear old friend Lady Cork had been overlooked. And he said this in such a manner that no one could for a moment doubt that he meant that his dear old friend had been overlooked by the devil. How he managed to express this I know not. I likewise once met Macaulay at Lord... Stanhope's The Historian's House, and as there was only one other man at dinner, I had a grand opportunity of hearing him converse, and he was very agreeable. He did not talk at all too much, nor indeed could such a man talk too much, as long as he allowed others to turn the stream of his conversation, and this he did allow. Lord Stanhope once gave me a curious little proof of the accuracy and fullness of Macaulay's memory. Many historians used often to meet at Lord Stanhope's house, and in discussing various subjects, they would sometimes differ from Macaulay, and formerly they often referred to some book to see who is right. But latterly, as Lord Stanhope noticed, no historian ever took this trouble, and whatever Macaulay said was final. On another occasion, I met at Lord Stanhope's house, one of his parties of historians and other literary men, and amongst them were Motley and Grote. After luncheon, I walked about Chevening Park for nearly an hour with Grote, and was much interested by his conversation, and pleased by the simplicity and absence of all pretension in his manners. Long ago I dined occasionally with the old Earl, the father of the historian. He was a strange man, but what little I knew of him I liked much. He was frank, genial, and pleasant. He had strongly marked features with a brown complexion, and his clothes, when I saw him, were all brown. He seemed to believe in everything which was to others utterly incredible. He said one day to me, 
why don't you give up your fiddle-faddle of geology and zoology and turn to the occult sciences the historian then lord mahon seemed shocked at such a speech to me and his charming wife much amused the last man whom i will mention is carlyle seen by me several times at my brother's house and two or three times at my own house his talk was very racy and interesting just like his writings but he sometimes went on too long on the same subject i remember a funny dinner at my brother's where among a few others were babbage and lyell both of whom liked to talk carlyle however silenced every one by haranguing during the whole dinner on the advantages of silence after dinner babbage in his grimmest manner thanked carlyle for his very interesting lecture on silence carlyle sneered at almost every one one day in my house he called groat's history a fetid quagmire with nothing spiritual about it i always thought until his reminiscences appeared that his sneers were partly jokes but this now seems rather doubtful his expression was that of a depressed almost despondent yet benevolent man and it is notorious how heartily he laughed i believe that his benevolence was real though stained by not a little jealousy no one can doubt about his extraordinary power of drawing pictures of things and men far more vivid as it appears to me than any drawn by macaulay whether his pictures of men were true ones is another question he has been all-powerful in impressing some grand moral truths on the minds of men on the other hand his views about slavery were revolting in his eyes might was right his mind seemed to me a very narrow one even if all branches of science which he despised are excluded it is astonishing to me that kingsley should have spoken of him as a man well fitted to advance science he laughed to scorn the idea that a mathematician such as we well could judge as i maintained he could of gotha's views on light he thought it a most ridiculous thing that any one should care whether a glacier moved a little quicker or a little slower or moved at all as far as i could judge i never met a man with a mind so ill adapted for scientific research while living in london i attended as regularly as i could the meetings of several scientific societies and acted as secretary to the geological society but such attendance and ordinary society suited my health so badly that we resolved to live in the country which we both preferred and have never repented of end of section four